Hey, this is Mitch Bannon with Sports Illustrated covering the Blue Jays. You're listening to The Walk Off with Scott and Adam. So excited to be joined by today's guest, Blue Jays reporter for Sports Illustrated, Mitch Bannon. Welcome to The Walk Off, man. Thanks so much for taking the time. Adam Scott, thanks for having me, guys. It's, it's good to wake up to a fun Blue Jays day for sure. <laughs> right? Lots of Blue Jays stuff to talk about. I mean, one... Real one piece in particular, anyways. Uh, before we get into that, I do want to just start with saying that I do actually really enjoy your writing, man. I like how connected you are with the minor league system, and most of all, uh, you are a great follow on Twitter. Like the stats and analytics that you kind of highlight is uh, not only informative, it's interesting. Great job, buddy. I like the uh, the breakdown of that very thorough, sticky substance uh, with. <laughs> Alec Manoa yesterday or the day before. That was always. Yeah, I wasn't sure if I was going to tweet that out. I'm like, oh, is this going to get someone in trouble? And it's like, no, this is this is too hilarious to not tweet out. (laughs) Quick high five. Clearly, very very worried about that right now in Major League Baseball. Yeah. Okay, let's get into it because I know this is what everyone on our YouTube chat wants to hear about. (laughs) This is what all Blue Jays fans. It's the big news. Our number one prospect. Gabriel Moreno last night got the call up to the bigs, right? Number four prospect in all of baseball. Without a doubt, Gabriel Moreno deserves to be in the big leagues. But I feel like the timing of this call up is interesting, right? Like, does this mean that Danny Jansen is injured maybe more long term? Uh, Is this trade interest in Alejandro Kirk? Is this just giving... Moreno a little bit more development time and maybe he'll just get sent back down when Danny's back up. What do you think, Mitch? Yeah, I think it's all of those are kind of realistic possibilities. Uh, I was under the impression that Danny kind of had the finger break, the fracture, and they were going to know with something like that, especially it's such a tiny bone, you kind of learn a lot more after the swelling goes down. You kind of do other scans and that usually takes about a week. So unless that swelling came down quickly and they got kind of an update on Danny, I don't think this is like a, we've now found out he's going to be out for a really long time or, or maybe out more than they initially expected. I think this is maybe they called him up because this is kind of what they were waiting for. They, they have two really good catchers. They have Zach Collins kind of as the depth guy. They always knew something was going to have to happen uh, to get Moreno up. And something kind of finally happened. So if you're not going to give him the shot now, you're just going to wait for another guy to get hurt or something else to happen in a month. So I think they kind of figured he's ready. Why not use this opportunity? When it comes to Moreno, what his bat is major league ready. Is his defense major league ready? I think the arm certainly is. Uh, I think the just his pure athleticism is anybody you talk to, that's like the first word they used to describe him. He's just, he's not the most imposing figure ever. He's kind of a small guy, but he's just so explosive. And that shows at the box that also shows behind the plate, especially with kind of his receiving is, is getting up there. But the arm is, you, you see the Bison's supposed to highlight every other night of him just gunning a guy out at second base mm. and it's not even close. And, and these are guys who, they're not, like speed isn't different between the major leagues and the minors. These are still really fast guys who are going to be able to steal bases. So it's not really going to get too much harder for him. Maybe guys in the big leagues will have a bit better jump, but I think that's certainly going to play. It's just getting him used to catching a guy who's 12 years older than him, getting him ready to, hey, let's say he's pitching Kevin Gosman. He puts down the fastball. Gosman shakes. Miranda really wants a fastball. You need the confidence to to put that signing down again. Like you, you can't kind of be a pushover as a big league catcher. So it's getting him maybe the mental side, the leadership side, prepared to do that. And you can't really do that in the minors. It's not the same catching Casey Lawrence versus catching a, a big league veteran. Even if the age is about the same, you got to kind of learn that in the big league. So there's only one spot he can learn that. Well, big league experience is so important at the catching position to begin with, right? I mean, we watched Alejandro Kirk just go through this, and although he was never overpowered offensively at any point, I mean, despite he did have obviously all players have ups and downs, but we did watch him really grow into the defensive catcher and the framing stud that we're seeing out of him in 2022, but this didn't happen overnight. Like, what can we expect out of Gabriel Moreno realistically? I think it's it's going to be a challenge for sure. He's a young guy. There's going to be cross-ups. There's going to be 
frame jobs that he just doesn't have. Uh, I, I got down to Buffalo once to see him. We didn't really get to see him at all in spring training. He looked fine to me. Uh, I'm not a catcher. One, my buddy and colleague, Ethan DeMandis, did come up as a catcher. So I was kind of asking him, hey, how does he look to you? And, and kind of picking yeah. his brain on that. He seemed to think he was fine. I think it's like Zach Collins is not a great big league framer. So if we're looking at how he updates or upgrades, sorry, on the roster right now, I think he'll probably be better than Collins. Collins is there for his bat, the big lefty power. He's got a decent arm, but uh, yeah, Kirk is really good at the bottom of the zone. I don't think he's going to be able to immediately come in and kind of match that. Uh, I think that'll be definitely the thing to watch because there's no framing stats in the minor leagues. There's internal numbers that this team has. They clearly think he's good enough to be in the big leagues. So we kind of got to trust them until we get a look at him in the big leagues. I mean, you did bring it up. His arm is impressive. I mean, the fact that he's throwing out 50% of runners is, like, that's eye-popping. That's an eye-popping stat, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe, like, 10, 15 years ago, a team like Detroit would see, okay, young catcher making his debut. Let's run on this guy. Like, mm -hmm. let's see what he's got. But now that the minor leagues are so rigorously covered and everyone kind of knows this, I don't think they're going to be testing him in this first weekend. I think they're going to know the scouting report on Gabby Moreno's. He's probably going to throw us out. So you, if you're stealing, you better be pretty confident. I don't think it's going to be like the traditional test the young guy out. Hmm. Adam, do we have anything in the YouTube comments to add on to this right now? Um, what happens if Moreno tears it up and what do we do when Jansen comes back? Uh, we need to make a <laughs> trade from our wealth of riches and add to our position of needs. That comes in from Jay. Or do we? I I don't think they do. I think if Moreno coming in immediately tearing up is the best case scenario. That's exactly what you want. And this team has showed a willingness to carry three catchers. They've done it with Collins. Uh, they did it briefly with McGuire last year. They've done it with Tyler Heineman, who's the third catcher on this team for a little bit. So if you're willing to carry those guys as a third catcher, why not Gabby Moreno? The interesting part becomes getting everyone playing time, and that would become a logistical nightmare for Charlie Montoyo, for <laughs> sure. Uh, I think... You then got to scrap some DH days for George Springer. You got to scrap those every so often DH days for Vlad. That's That would just become a necessity. So then the balance of trying to do that is how much do we need Springer to be DHing once every four games and how much do we need that kind of once a week or once every two weeks rest for Vlad versus Gabby Moreno's helping us win with his bat. Uh, I think if he comes in and tears it up, like Jansen's, he's going to have – three, four weeks at minimum to, to really run with this job, even if Jansen's a speedy recovery. So we're going to get a decent sample. It's not going to be like he's hitting 500 through five games, and then what do we do? We're going to get an idea of what Gavin Moreno is and, and how ready his bat is for the big leagues. And if it proves it's ready, I think you run with it. I don't think you're trading Danny Jansen or Alejandro Kirk midseason. I think you're trying to win a championship and move in one of those guys hurts that uh, i think yeah. you just try to figure out how to have all these guys on the on the roster this year and then make a decision in the offseason uh, i think the natural point is then you decide which one of jansen or kirk stays and that's kind of a, a november december issue not a july issue for the blue jays so friend of the show sportsnet ben nicholson smith just tweeted out something really interesting about homegrown players and how Toronto has continued to bring them up mid-season throughout the last five years. So you go back to 2018, Lourdes Gurriel Jr. and Danny Jansen made their debuts. 2019, of course, Vladdy, Bo, Cavan, Jordan Romano. 2020 with Santiago Espinal and Alejandro Kirk. 2021, of course, we all remember Manoa coming on the scene. And then Gabriel Moreno this year. That is a pretty impressive display of the pipeline coming up year after year not every team pulls that off <laughs> we've seen the orioles and royals and all those teams been trying to do it for the same amount of time and they're just now kind of getting that first wave of guys mm -hmm. those first top prospects i think this is kind of how mark shapiro and ross atkins drew this up they came in and had kind of a a couple of aces in their pocket with vlad Guerrero jr already being in the organization that certainly helps but then I think they kind of knew if we can build up this young position player core, push them up the minors. Those guys are usually much safer than the pitchers. We can figure out the pitching later. We can throw the money around to Kevin Gosman. Mm -hmm. We can go trade and guys for. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They, they, I think it's like the modern 
team build. It's kind of the opposite of how Anthopolis did it in the Braves, where they acquire a bunch of pitching prospects and then you figure out the hitters. I think that's more difficult, a lot more volatile. You, you see all the top pitching prospects they've had that have gotten injured, that have flamed out. Mike Soroka can't stay healthy right now, as good as he is, a Canadian guy. But then if you kind of build around position players, you can go get the established pitchers and and they've been able to do it. It's kind of, I would be interested to look back and ask them five years ago, I wasn't covering the team. Hey, like off the record, what is the plan here? I'm mm-hmm. sure they would say, exactly what has happened it's kind of everything has gone right for them it has been one thing about this front office that has blown me away is that when they mapped out what was going to happen and year by year when jays fans can expect what it has been almost exactly what they laid out right like yeah. get good by 2020 start to push contention in 2021 for the playoffs 2022 go for the world series and i mean we're in the middle. I don't wish to jinx anything here and knock on all the wood, but you know, so far so good. Yeah, exactly. I think sometimes the, the business you speak can distract people from the message at times, but the message has been pretty accurate. They, they haven't, they, there was those couple of years in the first couple of years are like, okay, we want to get younger and more athletic. And then they sign Curtis Granderson and it's like, okay, what are we doing here? But since then, I think they've kind of been on brand in this building up. They've been, they said they're going to go out and spend money. They said they wanted to get two pitchers in the offseason. They got Kevin Gosman and Yusei Kikuchi. Uh, you can nitpick on the individual deals, but if you trust this front office to make the moves, they're doing what they're saying to do. So I know we were just talking pitching and that the Jays have kind of gone the position player route and figuring out pitching. So let's, let's, let's talk pitching a second here. That game yesterday, <laughs> obviously incredibly frustrating. Uh, the way, to, just the how... It was a frustrating way for the series to end against the Royals, who hadn't even scored a run until yesterday's game, right? So let's do a quick temperature check for you on Yusei Kikuchi. Is this what we as fans can more or less expect for the rest of the year? Inconsistency, hints of brilliance mixed with mediocrity? I think we can only kind of evaluate future results on past results. And that's kind of all we've seen so far. And that's all we've (laughs) seen for basically his entire big league career. Like Mm -hmm. I remember last year covering a game where I think it was the Canada day game where it's like, how is this guy not the best pitcher in baseball? He's simply untouchable versus the Jays right now. And then I looked at his season stats and it's like, people are torching this guy. He he's losing the zone at times. I think that's kind of what Kikuchi is. Obviously they made those adjustments and then he's lost the zone since then, and teams have kind of adjusted back to him not throwing the, his usual slider. Like Teams were sitting on that slider at the beginning of the year. The Yankees absolutely mashed it in that one start. So when he's added a few miles an hour to it, it's been more of that, that kind of softer cutter thing. Teams are now not swinging at it nearly as much and kind of forcing him to put it in the zone, which when he can't do, it turns into disaster starts like yesterday. So mm-hmm. I'm sure there's going to be some really good starts for us this season. Of course. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure yeah. I'm sure there's going to be some bad ones too. I think that's kind of what we're going to get from you. Kikuchi. And as a fifth starter, he's a fourth starter right now, but as your fifth starter, I feel like you kind of take that. If your fifth yeah. starter can win you 10 games, that'll play. I've got a really good buddy. Who's a Mariners fan. And when the blue Jays picked up Kuk- Kikuchi his first his first words to me were like oh boy enjoy the roller coaster and I was like what do you mean and now I get what he means right <laughs> mm-hmm. well okay. the uh, Kikuchi start going only two thirds of an inning kind of highlights the problem we have with Ross Stripling because Ross Stripling I mean filling in admirably where wherever we wherever need him need to him. but man we sure could have used him yesterday yeah uh, I think you see the value that you might be getting in Nate Pearson and how this guy's going to be on the roster pretty soon because it with stripling and Kikuchi in the rotation, you know, those are two guys who are probably not going to give you six, seven innings every single time. Ross stripling. I think they really like in that five and dive role. Uh, It's Hey, we know you can game plan really good against these teams. He's a really smart guy who spends a lot of time looking at opposing lineups with the, the pitching coaches before every game. But then once they see it twice, they kind of get what you're doing to them. So you can't be running Ross Stripling out there for a third time through the order. You need to eat innings. And and obviously Stripling was the guy doing that for them. Trent Thornton's a little bit stretched out. Jeremy Beasley, we saw an unproductive tape, uh, cup of coffee uh, in a 
what two games I think he pitched for the Jays this year. They they're going to need length innings out of this bullpen, and uh, I think Nate Pearson can certainly give them that. So uh, I think Nate Pearson's an upgrade in that role over Ross Stripling. Mm-hmm. I would much rather Stripling giving me five productive innings in the rotation than being able to weaponize two three innings at a Pearson in the bullpen. So maybe this is an upgrade if if it works out, but. If it works out, has kind of been the motto for Nate Pearson during his career. So, so two questions there because we do have one from our, our chat here. Uh, Jim says, "Do you think we say, see Nate Pearson play in the MLB this year?" Um, and then, just to clarify what you were just saying, you you want to keep Stripling as the fifth starter and have Nate Pearson as the swing guy? I think in the short term, I think Pearson. To answer the first question, yeah, I think Pearson is going to be in the big leagues in the next six weeks. I, I think he's kind of in. We saw a, a pretty good outing from him in AAA last night. I watched back the highlights. And he There was a little bit of hard contact, but nothing dangerous. He was striking out guys, which you love to see. It, he was in, at How's using... His velocity, Mitch? Is, do you know what his velocity is hitting? I don't know what it was last night, but it, when he was in Dunedin, it was sitting 94, 95, and that's kind of unideal for him. You would like mm-hmm. to get a little bit higher, but I've heard it's ticked up. I've heard okay. since that outing, it's getting a little bit stronger. I think that is kind of the key for him. Obviously, control has been the big thing at the big league level. But if he's sitting 97, 98, he's the type of guy that's going to have confidence to throw that in the zone. And I think that unlocks everything for him. Uh, But yeah, I think we'll see him soon. And in the short term, I'm kind of a fan of stripling in the rotation, Pearson in the multi uh, multi inning weapon role. But then if we get like if Nate Pearson's going three innings every six days, being a super valuable weapon behind stripling or whenever, whenever they want to use him he's way more valuable to this team as a starter. So uh, I think once he proves he can get big league hitters out in a multi-inning role, then you give him the rotation spot. I don't think you can hand it to him right now. Do you think that happens this year? If there's another injury. Yeah. uh, I think they would need to be another injury or big underperformance from Stripling. If someone else, like if Kikuchi goes down and Stripling's your next option, I think then you're weighing Thomas Hatch versus Nate Pearson. And if Nate Pearson has kind of proven he can get guys out of the big league level. Why not give that role to Stripling and then call up Hatch as the long man, just backfill that way. Uh, I think something would have to happen. Someone is going to have to either Pearson's going to have to play really well, or someone is going to have to have to hurt, have to be hurt or underperformed for that to happen. I think he's just, when they're trying to win a world series, he's so valuable in that multi-inning bullpen role. We saw it with Aaron Sanchez a couple of years ago when he kind of broke in. And I know we've been talking about that Sanchez role for Pearson for <laughs> what seems like four years and he's never been able to really run with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's the role they have envisioned for him this year. And then as always, we'll come into camp with a a rotation spot that Nate Pearson can win. So let's dig a little bit deeper on this, Mitch, because Hinjin Ryu obviously just went back on the IL uh, and it doesn't look good. I know that he's going to one of the number one Tommy John specialists for a consultation here right away, which is, you know, makes you go like this with your collar. (laughs) How much do you think this happening moves up the front office's plans to maybe acquire a starting pitcher at the trade deadline or even maybe move the plans up, like, you know, sooner than the trade deadline? Not that Stripling, again, hasn't been incredible, but, like, as pitchers start to drop, the depth on this team starts to get exposed, and although the the top five are much better than anything we saw in the last few years with this team you start to look at their insular ter- insular anyways i'm not going to try and use that <laughs> word but you know what i'm saying yeah the top end depth do you think that they go outside of the organization maybe sooner than we thought i don't think they're going to pull the trigger anytime soon i think that definitely makes a starting pitcher a priority at the deadline i think if something else happens then that will move up the deadline. But I think they're kind of comfortable where they're at right now. They had Ross Stripling on this roster to be a fifth starter when someone got hurt, and now they're in that position. Uh, I think you would have to get someone who's a real significant upgrade over even Kikuchi and Stripling to make it kind of worth it at this point. Hey, Frankie think, Montes, if you will. <laughs> yeah, I, I <laughs> like that's the guy, but then you're probably bidding against the Yankees, the Red Sox. You're bidding against some teams who have a bigger need and are equally as motivated. So they're probably going to end up paying more. Uh, I don't know if the Jays are going to be motivated enough to go trade for Frankie Montes to be their fourth starter. And then what you're giving up top prospects for a guy who might not even pitch in a three game playoff series for you. I I think you kind of have to have that calculus 
I look at the, I think it was the Dodgers last year, went out at the deadline and got Tyler Anderson and Danny Duffy. They have a really good rotation. It wasn't that deep last year because of injuries. So they wanted to backfill it with guys like, okay, if we have another injury, one of these guys can come in and help us out. I think that's the, or maybe it's the, the Mariners got Anderson. It was a move like that at the deadline where it was a guy who could be a third or fourth starter, but he's also the type of guy who throws hard enough he can be a bullpen weapon. I think they're going to go out closer to the deadline and backfill the rotation that way, as opposed to getting a guy who would push guys down in the rotation right. pecking order. So the Blue Jays play 37 games in the next 38 days leading up to the All-Star game. We watched them play 30 and 31 to start the season. Obviously, the season starting two weeks late has put every team in a bit of a schedule crunch here. Do you think this has impacted baseball negatively in 2022? I mean, injuries are up a little bit, and we are watching some uh, pretty regular baseball right i mean these guys 37 games in 38 days is pretty crazy yeah i think that's an, i haven't thought about it quite like that way in that the schedule crunch does something like that i think it'll be interesting they, they got a schedule double header or on the card later it'll be interesting when they're playing what 40 or like 21 and 20 games later in the season too that's yeah. going to be tough i think it's kind of this the trend we've seen over the last couple of years where these injuries, especially these elbow injuries to pitchers are becoming more and more common. And it's not even just the guys throwing hundred miles an hour. You see it, see it to someone like Ryu throwing 90 miles an hour. It's just teams are so conscious of these injuries now. And these players are so val valuable to them. They don't want to push them. And so once you start having forearm tightness, alarm bells go off and maybe that's something you pitched through, uh, 10, 15, 35 years ago, but, but not today. I, I think it's yeah. just they understand. And maybe it is because of the delayed season and the shortened spring training. I'm sure pitchers weren't a fan of that. They weren't a fan of that in 2020 when they got a really short notice to, to be pitching. And then it kind of screwed up everyone's uh, plans. And then there was the last year. We also saw a bunch of injuries at the beginning of the season. It's just been a weird few years in baseball. And that could certainly play into it. But I do think it's just kind of the modern baseball environment. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, I know we talked pretty heavily catching, but I did want to just ask you this one last thing before we completely move on from this, because Kirk is having himself, yeah. you know, like a real breakout season here. He's going to be in all-star contention, if not on the team. He's really coming into his own here. So let's get wild, Mitch. You're the manager. Jays are in game seven of the ALCS. Is Alejandro Kirk your starting catcher? Alec Manoa is pitching. He certainly is. Uh, I think it's, <laughs> they love playing those matchups with as much as Charlie Montoyo doesn't says, Oh no, I don't have my catchers tied to any pitchers. He, he makes that very clear, but we've only seen Alejandro Kirk catch Alec Manoa. So clearly there's an attachment there and it's going pretty well. So why would you want to mess with that? Uh, if, if he keeps this up for the rest of the season, you got to be, he's got to be in the lineup four out of every five days, five out of every six. There's, there's no reason he can be coming out of the lineup. If he's not catching for me in game seven, because let's say it's Kikuchi pitching and you want Danny Jansen in there or, or Moreno and Gosman have some great tandem that they ride for the rest of the season and he's your catcher, he better be my designated hitter. That's for sure. I love it. I feel the same way. Adam, do we have any YouTube comments worth bringing up currently? Oh, yeah, they're all over the place, though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. They're having their own chat. We're having our own chat. Um, so let's just uh, let's roll with this one then. Uh, from New Brunswick, Canada guy says, I definitely think a catcher could be part of a trade package for maybe like a Frankie Montes from Oakland who has two years left or maybe Lopez from the Marlins who has three years of control. Um, just general with uh, Ryu looking like he's going to have an extended stay on the I.L., how desperately does this team need to find a replacement or is that going to just come from within? Yeah, I think they're kind of comfortable where they are right now, but yeah, once again, with kind of the trading, the catchers, I personally, and this isn't anything I've reported or anything from talking to people, but I just don't love the idea of trading a catcher in season right now. I know there was talks with the Marlins in the off season. I think those were, maybe more surrounding Teoscar Hernandez, and then they were going to maybe get a pitcher back. I don't see them doing that in season either. It's just this is a team that's got to be adding to the Major League roster, so pulling off of it doesn't seem like a great idea. I think if you're going after 
a Lopez or a Montes. Maybe it's an Aralvis Martinez you dangle, someone like that, Jordan Groshans, who are, who are highly regarded prospects in the industry. I think the A's in particular are not going to be a big fan of guys on the major league roster. They're certainly not going to be wanting to trade for Danny Jansen. He's just not going to fit their window. I'm sure they'd love to have Alejandro Kirk because with the way he's hitting right now, who wouldn't want to, but Mm -hmm. yeah, I I think it's going to be a prospect for pitching swap if it happens. And I see it as maybe more of a, an SB four type. Matt Chapman is hitting 361 over the last 10 games. And I know Blue Jays fans were waiting for this offensive output to start happening. I mean, defensively, the guy has just been a joy to watch play third base. He seems to be good to save at least a run a game, it feels like. I know it's really tough, Mitch, to kind of quantify what I'm about to ask you. But in your opinion, how much better is this team on the left side of the infield from last year? And what are some of the unseen benefits of this improvement? Yeah, I I think it's certainly better, but it's so hard to upgrade over Santiago Espinal. Like he was so good last year. Mm -hmm. The fact that they've gotten better defensively is very impressive. I I think one thing that's, we were talking about it early in the year. It was kind of a big story that's now kind of gotten forgotten is how much this team has shifted. And I think that's, Maybe it's analytically driven, but I also think it's being aware of kind of the guys that they have. If, if you shift that infield over, you can give Matt Chapman the entire left side of the infield and be like, okay, just handle this. We'll put three on the other side and he can do it. The range is phenomenal, right? Like even everything's both, phenomenal. Range, yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think he, that's maybe not something you were willing to do with Espinal, but now that you have a, a guy like that, like a, a free safety manning the entire left side of the infield. You yeah. you can do more aggressive shifts like that. They're not going to be able to do it next year from the sounds of it. So they're going to have to throw that one out the window. But I, I think it has been the little things like that. And then also Chabin from a leadership kind of thing. We, we see him out working every single day. He's taking ground balls every single day. Something we don't see is the leadership. But everyone you talk to says he's kind of come in with a fresh set of eyes He's not kind of worried about telling guys, hey, we got to be better at this. Hey, we got to do this. It's kind of good to have that kind of fresh perspective, I think, than having it in a respected leader guy like Chapman has been super valuable for the team. Out of curiosity, Mitch, just personally, what do you think about them banning the shift next year? Yeah, I kind of go back and forth. I like the shift because it's like, oh, this is so fun. Look what it it tells you how – teams view other hitters and and i think that's super interesting just understanding the scouting reports and it's so easy to visualize but from a baseball perspective yeah i'm good with a couple more doubles i'm good with a couple more singles i think it'd be fun more stolen bases i I love chaos in my baseball so if we're banning the shift it's going to create a little more chaos and i'm a fan of that but i I don't really have a strong opinion either way it's kind of like 85 percent of the fan base and people in baseball want to ban it Sure, let's ban it. I'm interested to see how much it does affect the game. How big do you think banning the shift could be for baseball? Yeah, I think it's for a guy like Zach Collins, Joey Gallo. I think it's huge. Like those are guys who were huge, valuable number four hitting power hitters even 10 years ago. And now they've just kind of been negated if you don't hit a home run you're probably in out we're gonna put four guys in the outfield three guys on the right side of the infield and then all we're gonna give you is the home run or the or the bloop single to left field i think it's gonna change that specific subsection but these teams are so smart they're gonna figure out a new way to kind of adapt to maybe not those types of hitters but to someone else the they're always a step ahead and, and you're making these rules because the league is behind the teams the team's are way more invested in figuring these things out. There's there's just going to be something new in five years that we're going to have to ban in baseball because it's taking away singles from somebody. Well, the good news for Joey Gallo is finally he gets legislated into being a good player. So there we go. (laughs) (laughs) He gets to sign wherever he wants to. He can go to Great American Ballpark and just hit 1,000 home runs. And just hit 1,000 home runs. Exactly. So Rymel Tapia had a bad first impression, if you will, to Blue Jays fans, but he is red hot right now. He hit a 441, no doubter, foot home run last night. Uh, I know the Jays were looking to improve his launch angle, and lately it seems to be paying off, right? Rymel Tapia, just bottom line, is probably better than Jays fans gave him credit for to start with, right? Yeah, I think so. I think 
you kind of mentioned that they've been really toying with his swing and toying with him a lot. So I think we kind of got to understand that those first, that first month of struggles was because there was a lot going on behind the scenes with trying to change him, trying to eliminate those ground balls. Cause even if he's a speedy guy, there's only so many ground balls to shortstop you can beat out. It's just a hard thing to do. And it's not something many people can successfully do in 2022 baseball. I think, 441 feet. I didn't know where I'm out to hit a ball that far, but uh, I think Neither that did I. <laughs> I was like, are we playing in Colorado? What's going on here? Exactly. Yeah. And that like hitting no doubt home runs in Kauffman stadium is something like yeah. only Salvador Perez does. And that's like, <laughs> it, it, yeah, I was, I think that kind of speaks to, Hey, maybe something's here. Maybe they've figured something out getting him. And it's even, I think later in the game, there was a, a screaming liner to second base. And that's like exactly what they wanted him to be doing, hitting the ball on a line or in the air and just finding alleys. Cause he is, he's chaotic on the base pass. Uh, I, I like, as I said, I like chaos in my baseball and Rymel Tapia kind of embodies that once he can get it into a corner, he's the type of guy or a rare guy on this team who can let go to triple. Uh, I think they understand that if they just kind of, he's hitting them, like this on the ground, you can just get a few more degrees of launch angle, free up his swing a little bit. My colleague Ethan talked to a couple hitting coaches about, and I think the phrase they use is kind of freeing up his swing, which I don't, that kind of sounds like nothing, but when you think about him kind of being that ground ball guy and kind of being bought into it, because in cores, he was not the type of guy who's going to be able to hit it over the wall like everyone else. So he had to do something different. And I think they're trying to turn him back into maybe more traditional kind of line to line guy. Yes, do it. <laughs> Anything's better than a 75% ground ball rate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. So one thing that I really do enjoy about your Twitter is that your attention to data and anal- and analytics and how that affects certain players is always on display. And I, I do really enjoy that. So I'm curious your thoughts, if there's anyone on this team who has maybe struggled but whose and numbers aren't popping off the page that you feel we can expect more out of and a, maybe a bigger second half of the season from. Yeah. Is it uh, is it a cop out to say match happen? Cause I feel like we've already seen that. Uh, yeah. I wrote a piece a couple, two weeks ago. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll take credit for him being hot. I think since I yes. wrote that he's been on a scorcher. So uh, I think there, they were very concerned about how the new baseball was impacting Chapman, maybe more than other guys. We saw a lot of those fly balls die at the warning track. So there were some behind the scenes tweaks there and the expected numbers were kind of already really good. So if they just bought, bought that extra five to 10 feet from him, got him to hit a few more balls on a line, he's hitting the ball harder than anyone in baseball right now. I, he might be second or third on the team in hard hit rate for the blue Jays, which they're a team that hits the ball really hard. So I think we can kind of expect this uh, to keep up. I think he's a guy kind of built for the blue Jays home stadium in a normal year. I think he could really be good. Another guy who's maybe also a cop-out answer is Vlad Guerrero Jr. Uh, I think you look at his struggles for that month there that he's kind of come out of, and it, it looked a little bit like that rookie season, Vlad, where the, the ground ball rate was a little too high, the launch angle was a little too down, and, and he works with the hitting coaches more than anyone to try to get back to that launch angle. And I think he, he knows – what he has to do to be locked in because he did it for a full season last year. He, he knows where he needs to be. He can keep going back to that. And so now it's not trying to figure out how to be good. It's just, Hey, when my swing's a little bit off, how do I get back to where it's good? And, and I think we're, we're seeing him do that right now. And there's no reason to expect it won't keep up for the back half of the season. Vlad's just slightly off, right? Like that's the problem. He's just, just a little bit off. Yeah, I saw people were kind of talking about, hey, are they attacking him differently? How does that work? But that's never really been an issue with Vlad. He's ahead of the pitchers. He knows what they're trying to do just as much as they know. If they're going to be throwing him the soft stuff away, he knows not to take it. I I think there was a couple of weeks he saw him swinging at that. uh, And I think, or he knows to take it, sorry. We saw him swinging at that and that was frustrations. And I think he'll be the first to tell you that he knows he should not be swinging at those pitches. So once he starts to get a little confident, once he starts to wait for his pitch, and once the timing comes back, uh, I think we've we've seen him be a little more patient and kind of round into the Vlad form we know. So this might make me seem like a bit of a conspiracy theorist here, but offense is up substantially across the league since May 25th, like every single team. 
is it possible baseball secretly switched the balls again? I think. Are we just going to say it's warm and this is why it's. (laughs) I'm kind of inclined to say that. I know it sounds like maybe a cop out, but I think the issue with the balls, as I understood it, was not like an en masse change to every single ball. It was just ball to ball inconsistency because these are still kind of hand sewed or maybe machine sewed. And so they're not all going to be the exact same ball. And I think the big thing with the balls early in the season was that there was a few different issues. Pitchers were saying they were squishy. I don't really know what that means, but there was something with the seams as well, that they were a little puffier. And so the ball was getting a little more drag in the air. Great, great words, right? Puffy and squishy. squishy. It's like, yeah, that's not how I want my baseballs described. And I think that's why we saw things dying at the warning track. And so maybe if they made them a little more consistent, maybe not changing them, but getting more the ball that they wanted in the first place. And obviously major league baseball has done stuff with the balls to impact stuff in the past. This is, they're not, they don't have clean hands in this whole thing. There's definitely (laughs) stuff going on, but I think maybe it's more that they have consistently been able to produce a baseball. If there, it has been a change. I think it's more that they're consistently able to produce the baseball that they want, as opposed to having these kind of bad baseballs that are dying at the warning track and that pitchers are, saying are squishy well i figured it was probably coincidence but honestly after the sticky stuff last year and just how they handled it and the fact that they just like mid-season made major rule changes i was like i wouldn't put it past major league baseball to do something like switch the ball secretly you know but yeah it's it's definitely possible but i think we we often see offense pick up right now yeah did we have anything in YouTube we should get to, Adam? Yeah, this one just kind of ties into the Vladdy uh, performance numbers. This one comes from Rachel. Um, I don't even know what a good batting average is anymore. Uh, what would you consider to be a good batting average? Uh, with Vladdy hitting two forty three right now, is that bad or is that just bad for Vlad? I think that's bad. I, I like The thing is, it's... Like how you get there. If if you got a 380 on base percentage, no one really cares what your mm-hmm. uh, batting average is. If you're just walking a lot, you're getting your sack flies. You can hit 210, but I think a good batting average is still the same it's always ever been 270, 280. But it's those are more for guys like Santiago Espinal who are more bat to ball driven are not going to take a thousand walks. So I think it's there's kind of the subsections of players have changed where. Some guys, they just aren't going to care about batting average at all. So there's not a batting average that is bad. They only care about that OBP and they care about kind of their overall production. Uh, But yeah, I think what a good batting average still is kind of the same. It's just some guys you can't evaluate with that anymore. Speaking of batting average and OBP, Kevin Vigio is hitting 170 with a 370 on base percentage, which is just <laughs> the most insane. Biggio the peak Kevin Vigio slash line. Peak Kevin <laughs> Vigio, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's interesting. Kevin can make hay against these kind of righty, heavy, bad teams for the next 10 days and earn himself some more playing time. If these are guys who are going to miss with the zone, he's just proven he's not going to swing at that. We'll see what happens when he faces Garrett Cole. And we're going to, I think he's actually traditionally been pretty good against Cole, but we'll see what happens when he has to face a guy throwing 99 at the top of the zone. That's always been the hole in his swing. And so I think Kevin is a super valuable player for this team because they kind of understand how to use him right now. He's not an everyday player. They're going to put him in against guys they think he can succeed against. And that's what allows him to be good and allows him to have, what is that, 20% walk rate or something crazy like Mm -hmm. that. Uh, But yeah, I think we still, he's not going to be a 162 game player until he proves he can hit that high fastball. He does love that high fastball, but boy, does that high fastball not love him. Like, it is just, he's all over it, and it wants nothing to do with him. Mm-hmm. So, so it's... While, while we're on the topic of uh, Kevin Biggio, this one comes from Jen. It says, what are your thoughts on Biggio's value to this team? You kind of touched on it. Um, mm-hmm. And what is his value on the trade market? Yeah, I think it's hard to evaluate the trade market just because with a guy like Biggio, especially if someone's trading for him, it's probably because they see something there they can unlock. No one's going to go out, not no one, but if you're trading for Kevin Biggio right now, you kind of know what you get. It's going to be a 
a heavy platoon, maybe 110, 120 game player who's not going to face the high velocity guys that often, but he's going to be a really good walk rate and a valuable lefty bat in your lineup off your bench. He can play everywhere. Like that's a super valuable player. But if someone's going to trade something legit for him, it's because they think they can change his swing and they think they can make him a different player. And the Jays have kind of been toying with that for a couple of years. And I think they've given up on it a bit. I think they, they understand the value that this Kevin Biggio has, and they're going to stop trying to mess with them and just say, Hey, you go do what you're good at. And we're going to take that on our roster. So I think it's probably more valuable to have him as the super utility lefty bat on a team that really needs lefty bats and really needs guys who can play everywhere rather than going out and trying to trade partner. Because think- truthfully with where his values at currently, you're not getting much back anyways, right? Like maybe a Randall Grishik. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. if you're trading Kevin Bishu, it's for a guy who's not an all-star. It's yeah, you're a guy who's Ryan probably Tapia back. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's just another guy who has is good at some stuff and is not good at other stuff. So why not just kind of roll with the guy who fits this organization as a really good clubhouse guy? You know what you have. It's just take the Kevin Biggio you know as opposed to the one you're going to trade him for. <laughs> and do you think Kevin Biggio sticks with the uh, MLB club the rest of the year, or is he going to be up and down all season? Yeah, I think he's got a role on this team. We'll see what happens at the deadline. Uh, I think if they go out and trade for two relievers, a big lefty bat, let's say Josh Bell, and then they also go get, go get Ben Intendi, then you have a roster crunch and you've got to figure out the optional guys you can move. Right. Bradley's Zimmer's out of options. So if you're sending him down, another team's probably going to take a crack at him just because the big power peripheral numbers and the defense and the speed, he's just not the type of guy that clears waivers. So then maybe you're sending down Kevin Biggio. You've already used the option here this year. So you can kind of send him on that shuttle, shuttle I think, four more times with the new rule. He's, he's definitely a guy who can be sent down, but he would have to be pushed out by someone else, I think. Okay. So we do have some listener questions here for you. So I will throw to Adam right away. We don't want to keep you too much longer here, but I will end on this before we do that. Adam Simber. Obviously, he continues to make this front office look like a group of geniuses for getting him for Joe Panic, especially with the years of control that came with him. If you had to pick your top three leverage relievers in this bullpen, who are they? Does Adam Simber make that list? And I know Tim Mesa's coming back right now, but let's leave him out of that for now. Okay, leaving Mesa out, I think, makes this question a lot easier for me. It would, would be a difficult one with him in the equation, but I think obviously Romano, we can Mm -hmm. kind of don't even have to talk about that. It's obvious why he's been one of the best relievers in baseball. I think Jimmy Garcia is the number two. Uh, I think at the beginning of the year, uh, he wasn't getting the swing and miss. He was more of a contact guy, but he was still getting out. There were, and also I think something I look at is what spots they're using them in. I trust the guys making these decisions more than I trust my own eyes, just because they get paid a lot more to do it than, than I do. <laughs> so if they're using him against the top of the order in the eighth inning, they clearly see something in him and he's been productive in the last two weeks. The velocity's ticked up, the strikeouts have ticked up. So you're only getting better with Jimmy Garcia. And he's a guy who's, I think he's got 50 plus career saves. He's a guy who's mm-hmm. got a low heartbeat. He's not going to get shaken by any moment. There, he's pitched in the that. playoffs for the Great Dodgers. Point. Yeah. And so I think that's important. And then after that, I would put Simber. Uh, I think maybe at the beginning of the year, I would have Simber and Richards kind of 1A, 1B. Richards has kind of struggled to locate his fastball, has let up runs in a bunch of his recent appearances. So that gives the advantage to Simber. Simber is a guy who you really got to be careful with the matchups you use him in. You don't want to be putting him in there against uh, like three straight lefty bats, even if he's been pretty good against lefties, but you got to be a little more careful. I think they love Simber in the eighth inning, ninth inning against the bottom of the order. Uh, the guys who aren't going to be able to hit the big home run, he can let up a single, a bloop single, because he's when he misses with his pitches, they become a little more hittable and someone can get a double. But then he's also the guy who's not going to miss enough to allow that guy to come around to score. So he's the perfect guy to use against kind of the bottom of the order. And so when Mesa comes back, maybe a bump Simber to that four spot in the, the leverage reliever hierarchy. But for now, yeah, I would go with Simber there for sure. I want your opinion on Richards, and there might be people listening to this right now who don't like what I'm about to say because I still like Trevor Richards. I think his changeup is phenomenal, and if he can just kind of get back to where he was, and we see this with relievers all the time, kind of fall out of it for a month or two and then find it again. Trevor Richards still could have some value for this team down the stretch, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. I'm in love with that changeup, too. It might be the best pitch 
in the entire organization it's right disgusting. now. It's yeah, it's if you like Kevin Gosman splitter, there's no reason not to like Trevor Richards change up because it's basically the same pitch. I think the key with him is the fastball location, mm-hmm. though. He's when you have that big breaking change up, you need to get ahead of guys. So then they're forced to swing at that pitch as, as opposed to taking it. And so when he hasn't had that the past couple of weeks, he's gotten behind in counts. He can't use the change up as a swing and miss pitch. He has to throw more fastballs and that's when you get hit. And so I think it's just, he's a small refinement away, a couple of good outings away from just getting that fastball back in the top of the zone. And then the change up will play as we know it will. And John Carlos Stan hit that crazy home run against them last year, but people can't hit the change up aside from Stan. And so if you can get into counts where you can use that, I think Richards is a super valuable, even leverage reliever for this team. Yeah. I mean, it's easy to have a short memory as a baseball fan, but like he has been so valuable over his tenure with this team. Like I'm not ready to, (laughs) I know there's, there's tweets out there being like, package him up and get him out of here. And I'm like, no, not Richards. (laughs) If you get Richards out of town, you're just going to be trying to find another Trent Richards. So, or Trevor Richards. So, and if you want, yeah. like, he's valuable, too, because they're using him more than more in this kind of multi-inning role. And we talked about the need for length in this bullpen. And if you can get 1.2 innings from Richards, if you can get two innings from Richards, and if he starts getting that back and can be effective in that multi-inning role, oh, it's, yeah, what a weapon. Mitch, you've been so generous with your time. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it, man. And this has been a lot of fun. Uh, we'll throw to Adam here and just get a few listener questions in. I know we had a few from our Discord and stuff like that, so uh, we need to get to that. Otherwise, we'll get shit. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right. So first one comes in from uh, Mark. Realistic expectations. What kind of numbers does Moreno, Nate, uh, Moreno need to put up in order to stay up? Cool. That's a good question. Uh, I think the key for him is going to be the walks. I, I think the – the game power hasn't really been there for Moreno. He's, I think if he comes in and looks like a catching version of Santiago Espinal, where he, he can run into the occasional home run, but he's spraying the ball around. He's not swinging at too many bad pitches. That's kind of the ideal right now. The, the game power will come as he ages for sure. And he's got the doubles power right now, which is phenomenal. But I think if you, the numbers he'll need to stay up is interesting because we don't know. It kind of depends on everybody else. If everyone else is playing bad, Moreno playing bad doesn't look as glaring. If everyone's playing great, he's probably got to hit 300. But I, I think a slash line around 280, 330 for the, the batting average and on base percentage is a good start. And then you kind of take the power numbers that come with that. I, I don't think they're too terribly concerned about how many home runs he's going to be hitting during this stint. Okay, next one comes from Aaron and says, do you think we see Jordan Groshans in 2022? Yeah, I was actually talking about this with some people the other day. I think for sure. And I think it'll be in the role that we saw Kevin Smith in last year, where it's like, okay, he's had such a good minor league season. We got to reward him in some capacity. Someone goes down uh, in September or August, or something happens where you get that extra roster spot. I think he's going to be rewarded with that, especially if he keeps up what he's doing right now. He's been great in AAA. And they're kind of moving him around, getting him some positional versatility. I wouldn't be surprised if we see him get some corner outfield work soon. Uh, obviously, if they trade for like three hitters, that pushes him down the totem pole for sure. But uh, I think we got a really good shot of seeing him as kind of like the next man up infield late in the season. I think right now it might be more Vinny Capra, Otto Lopez. But when we get closer to August, September, and Groshans keeps doing this, I think he'll kind of become that guy. Awesome. Okay, next one comes in from Dougie. Says, I'm still holding out for J-Ram. I know he signed a contract extension, but I think his new contract still makes him a very appealing trade target. Uh, Could this still be an option in the next year and a half for a team, even if it's not the Blue Jays? I would love to say yes so much. I think that would just be such an unreal fit. He's so fun. What an amazing player. Like the best player in the league right now, it seems. Yeah, yeah, yeah got two doubles every single game i i, I want to say yes so badly but i just can't in good conscience i think that guy wants to be in cleveland they got him on a really good contract that they're probably stoked it. with and Why? so yeah, <laughs> he's not going anywhere <laughs> just has a great house with a great view or something like that two pools in the back loves the lake someone yeah. should have told him on lake ontario it's just as nice <laughs> there's better lakes 
Uh, we'll name a lake after Jose Ramirez if he comes to Toronto. I'm sure of that. Okay, uh, next one comes in from Uncle Jer. Says, uh, Jay's not signing Teoscar, I think, or they already would have. I bet they are targeting a lefty outfielder instead uh, in the off season. What are your thoughts on that? Teoscar's long-term future with the Jays. Yeah, I think that is a big question for this off season. Because if you let him get to that final year, there's not a whole lot of incentive except for throwing a big bag at him to not go explore free agency, especially yeah. if they're going to talk to Vlad and Bo, which they're certainly going to talk to Vlad and Bo this winter. Those guys are kind of priority one and two. And if you sign them both the 300, 400 million dollar contracts, someone's going to be the odd man out. Uh, I think Lord is possible not to jump all over the place here. Yeah, I, I yeah. definitely possible. I think this this organization doesn't love talking huge extensions in season, so I don't think we're going to see anything in the next 3-4 months. I but I think like the first call after the season last year or after the yeah, after the season last year was to Jose Barrios to get conversations started on that. I think the first call this season is going to be to Vlad and Bo and then you're going to see where you're at. If they can't get a deal done, I think you got to ink somebody because you can't have all of these guys go to free agency and then you end up with no one. So I think Teo becomes a legit option. Right. But I also think someone's going to be the odd man out. Like uh, no matter how much money Rogers has, you're probably not going to be able to extend Teo and Lourdes and Vlad and Bo, especially if they all keep hitting as they have early in their careers. And I think Teo's the type of guy who he knows he can go get a lot of money from another organization. So there's not a whole lot of motivation to take a huge pay cut to stay with this core. I know this uh, is spiteful. Do you know what my dream scenario is here? Is that the Jays actually do extend Vlad and Bo while Stanton is in free agency and, and Yankees fans are just flailing in the wind, just panicking? <laughs> I would love that so much. <laughs> it's possible. Uh, just to follow up for me then on that, Vladdy and Bo, if it's only one, who should the priority be? Yeah, who tough spot. Uh <laughs> I certainly am happy. I'm not the one of us to make this decision. I, I think it, I don't see a whole lot of possibilities where they just bring back one, like unless one of them actively wants to leave. And th- I've gotten no indication that that's true. I yeah. think they both love it here. They understand that this is a wealthy organization who can give them both what they want. Then they could both stay here. I, I think long to, if this is like a 10 year deal, I'd probably rather sign Bo just because he's, I think an age a little more graceful. You can move him over to second base. There's not a whole lot of spots you can move Vlad. It's like if he's moving off first base, it becomes designated hitter. But he's also objectively the better hitter. So it makes it a tough call. Uh, I think at the price point, I would probably, gun to my head, I would take Bo. But I think it's either a both or none situation. But I don't have any, I don't have any reporting on that for sure. I just think it's, if you're signing one guy to a $400 million contract, you can sign two guys to a four hundred million dollar contract. <laughs> I love it. Okay, uh, a couple more here, and then we'll let you go. Uh, so this one comes in from Tony. Says renovations coming to the outfield wall at Rogers this off season. Uh, what changes do you want to see to the outfield wall in Toronto? So I mentioned a couple times I like chaos in my baseball, so I would love a not symmetrical, perfectly rounded wall. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if they're going to do that. I know. So Mark Shapiro, a big reason he was brought in is because of the work he did at that Cleveland stadium. And that is a very unique kind of outfield situation. We got a little green monster action in left field, some jagged edges in center field. I don't know if they're going to go too, that far. As I understand it, there was talk a few years ago of kind of shifting the infield. So home plate was right in front of the CN Tower. It sounds like that's not in the cards right now. They're not, not going to be doing something quite that aggressive. I think kind of any day now we're going to find out a little more information about kind of the renovation plan. So okay. kind of keep an eye out for that. We'll see if that we actually find that out or if there's going to be a delay. I think anyone who's ever renovated their kitchen knows there's <laughs> often delays in these processes, but yeah, I would, I would love a, a unique outfield wall. I don't know if it's going to happen, but I'd be a fan of it. Something chaotic dishwasher in the outfield. Let's renovate this kitchen. Yeah. Let's um, take the Houston, the Houston, <laughs> mound and put it in center field and get a, get a pool. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> uh, what, one of my biggest pet peeves with Rogers is symmetric wall. So boring. And also it's what, 10 feet tall the whole way around. It's like my biggest pet peeve in baseball. I don't know why you'd have walls so big that 
eliminate one of the most exciting plays in all of sports, the home run robbery. Like, mm-hmm. if happened, you're going to have a guy climb up and, and it's still iconic. Yeah. Yeah. Like you make a, a massive leaping catch at the wall and it's like, well, he didn't take a home run away. He took away a double. Like, let's just make them six, seven foot walls with weird angles. And I'm happy. I do kind of wonder, and I don't know this either way, if the fact that they don't have a traditional warning track because it's all turf plays in to what they do with the wall. I think you don't want guys running back, not realizing that the warning track and flipping head over heels over a wall in left field. So maybe they feel like it's the safest option to just kind of have a a very predictable wall with a lot of padding that no one is going to flip over. I, I don't know that for sure, but maybe that is why they're so kind of tied to this wall maybe that's a fact well let's fix the warning track then let's either go dirt or trampolines and (laughs) get really chaotic with it okay last question here for real though uh this comes in from craig uh when when is baseball going to finally flesh out that all-star weekend and implement a full-blown skills competition like the nfl the nhl and the nba yeah i the thing is, I think they kind of love their current setup. They love the history of the home run derby. Um, and the all-star game in baseball, I think, is one of the best. So we don't necessarily yeah. need to touch the actual game. I love I think it's in the KBO. They do that, like, bunt contest. Yeah. Bring, like, super weird yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Do it for the two hours before the home run derby. Try something out new like that every year, and then we'll see if something sticks. Yeah. I'm super uh, happy with it. But I think also baseball it's kind of happy with what they have right now and the TV rights that they've kind of attached to these events. Fair enough. All right. Well, that's all we got for listener questions again, Mitch. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you joining us. This was really a lot of fun, man. We really enjoyed talking baseball with you. Yeah. I had a blast too. Anytime you want me to have on, let me know. It was a great time.